Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending Ruskin's webinar on airflow considerations for COVID-19. We have a great presentation lined up from three Ruskin experts. This webinar will be approximately 45 minutes long, followed by a question and answer section. After the session is over, we will send out a link with the information from the webinar, a certificate of attendance, and a link to next week's webinar on damper selection and product overlap, presented by Mike Poyazzo. Our first speaker today is Glenn Esser, who will be discussing airflow measurement, followed by James Livingston and Cody Jakes, who will discuss louver and ERV solutions. My name is Glenn Esser. I've been with Ruskin Air Measurement Group since January of 2006. I went back and pulled up these first four slides from my earliest air measurement presentations. And the reason for measuring outside air were the same then as they are today healthy indoor air quality. In this picture, mold is covering the interior walls of this home. The person shown here wearing the hazmat suit would look perfectly normal shopping at your local store today. During the first energy crisis in 1974, this led to a reduction of outside air intake to conserve energy and as a result, the indoor air quality was so poor that the World Health Organization ended up coining the term sick building syndrome. Building codes were subsequently put in place to require, as they do today, a healthy amount of outside air to be introduced into, the, into commercial buildings. Fresh outside air is used to prevent buildings from growing things inside the walls and the, and the air ducts, things that have been proven to be the root cause of systemic health issues with the building's occupants. With no outside air or little outside air, buildings can get sick and make the people working in them sick too. The air inside commercial buildings should never be detrimental to the health of the building's occupants. The negative health impacts of poor indoor air quality are well documented, allergic reaction, infectious illnesses, reduced comfort, reduced productivity and employee morale, complaints, absenteeism, and potential lawsuits. The way we've solved the problem then is the same as now. The solution to pollution is dilution. And with the introduction of fresh outside air, the rate of microbial growth is slowed, resulting in a healthier environment for people. That brings us to today's webinar. We published this paper on our Ruskin website in March, and hopefully you've had an opportunity to download it and have already increased your building's outside air ventilation air intake rates. ASHRAE standard 62.1 is the basis for minimum outside air requirements in the international building codes and is most likely your local building codes as well. It shows the amount of air necessary, outside air necessary, to prevent your building from getting sick. No outside air is required in an unoccupied building. However, when even one person is in the building, then the building area component <clears throat> of the outside air is required. For this example, this is a partial list. For example, I'm sorry, this is a partial list <clears throat> from ASHRAE 62.1 showing the minimum ventilation rate for jails and schools. What's shown here on the left is the occupancy category and the amount of air required per person in that space. This table shows <clears throat> for the occupancy category, correctional facility and educational facilities. This shows, this table is showing a minimum ventilation rate for a jail cell requires only five CFM per person plus 0.12 CFM per square foot of space with a maximum occupancy of 25 people per 1,000 square foot. For a classroom, this table is showing a minimum ventilation rate of 10 CFM per person or double the amount of air per person in a correctional facility with the same 0.12 CFM per square foot of space and a Maximum occupant density for ages five to eight is 25 people per 1,000 square foot. And for ages nine and up, that density increases to 35 students per 1,000 square foot of space. Could this be a reason we're seeing 
uh, COVID outbreaks in prisons and jails because of the difference in ventilation rates. I've highlighted note B at the bottom of the table that states the requirements of this table provide for acceptable indoor air quality. The requirements of this table do not address airborne transmission of viruses, bacteria, and other infectious contagions. And that's too bad because <clears throat> we could really use some guidance and direction on how much is enough. But we do have some guidance from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. On the CDC's website, ventilation specifications for areas of the hospital are shown in Appendix B and Table B.2 guidelines for environmental infection control in healthcare facilities um, shows what the ventilation rates should be for a hospital. And just yesterday, we received a copy of ASHRAE's position document on infectious aerosols. And uh, we will provide a link to it at the end of today's presentation. But this part of the table is showing <clears throat> a recovery room, for example, requires two outside air changes per hour and a total of six air changes in an hour. Expressed as a percentage, this would simply be a minimum of 33% outside air delivered to the space with the total amount of air being delivered is a function of the size of the room. Take the cubic feet of space of the room, multiply that times six, and that would be the amount of air that's supplied. And of that, 33% should be coming directly from outside. Of course, it's conditioned, but it's what it, that's how we do it. So we know that increased ventilation rates, please click there, next slide, thank you. We know that increased ventilation rates produce healthier working environments. From a study published in the ASHRAE Journal July 2002, they established a cause and effect relationship between poor, lower ventilation rates and increased occurrence of sick leave. For educational purposes here, I'm going to summarize the, the, this, this, their paper. And this is the title of their paper that they published, Indoor Air Quality and the Impact on Employee Sick Leave. Please contact ASHRAE to request a copy of this article. But when this paper was written, there was a large company called Polaroid Corporation, known for making cameras that could produce pictures in 60 seconds. How novel, huh, that you would wait 60 seconds for a picture today. For this paper, they studied a campus with 40 buildings, and 115 independently ventilated work areas within those buildings and made a correlation between the ventilation rates in each work area and the number of days of sick leave taken by the people working in those spaces. The authors came to the conclusion that lower ventilation rates were associated with 130% uh, reduction, or pardon me, 130% greater rate of total sick leave. So poor air led to more people getting sick and taking time off. Uh, their paper suggested that companies could save money by spending more to heat and cool the space and made the argument that the increased cost of energy could be more than offset by reducing the expense associated with sick leave, lost productivity, et cetera, of those employees who weren't there. Science tells us today with the pandemic that increased energy costs are easily justified and lives saved employees that cannot work for two weeks or longer if they contract the COVID-19 virus. So facility managers should be checking their outside air intakes, making sure their air measurement stations are working correctly. They should replace dirty air filters. They should make sure that the outside air dampers are open and working correctly. Moisture eliminators need to be cleaned and free of any obstructions. The maximum amount of outside air limits are limited only by the ability of the heating and cooling system to keep the humidity and temperature inside of the building under control. The system is generally designed for the hottest day of the year and the coldest day of the year. And when we're not at either one of those extremes, you can bring in more outside air. On a hot day, of course, overventilation can make the temperature in the building less comfortable and result in higher humidity. And on cold days, the building will be too cold and 
humidity always needs to be maintained between 40 and 60 percent for a healthy environment. Air measurement stations can help quantify how much outside air is being introduced or exhausted to keep the building under control and to make sure that nothing less than the required outside air is brought into the building when occupied. If you're watching this and you're the building owner, what can you do today? For example, many congregations want to resume services and they don't want to endanger their members. What can we do today? How can you confirm the indoor air quality in your facility is safe? One of the methods used in the Polaroid study was to quantify whether or not the space was ventilated correctly by measuring indoor CO2 concentrations. As we breathe in, we take in oxygen. As we breathe out, we expel CO2. And that amount of CO2 varies based on our activity levels. So the ventilation rates can be extrapolated by measuring CO2 concentrations in the space. Using a CO2 sensor to sample the air in the breathing zone, approximately light switch level from the floor is called the breathing zone. Uh, CO2, by the way, is heavier than air, so concentrations will be higher near the floor and lower near the ceiling. So a CO2 sensor reading of 1,200 parts per million or more indicates that the space is underventilated and is not meeting the requirements for the introduction of the minimum amount of outside air required. CO2 sensor measurements equal to 1,000 parts per million or a differential of 700 parts per million or less above background indicates that the correct minimum ventilation rates are taking place or better. So during this pandemic, the difference between background measurements and indoor space measurements needs to be reduced and that means your CO2 parts per million set points should be reduced to bring in more outside air. So if you have CO2 readings in the space that are less than 1,000 parts per million, this would indicate that the space is being ventilated correctly. If you have a CO2 sensor and it's reading around 400 parts per million, then you're standing outside. That's what our background levels are today. A control system should be in place to maintain minimum ventilation rates and that system should increase and decrease the amount of outside air based on the number of people occupying the space. And normally, uh, we would expect you to close that outside air damper when there's no people in the space and the building's unoccupied. We're all concerned with beating this pandemic. <clears throat> Lots of businesses are suffering economic losses and are anxious to get back to work. How can you have a community or a social connection without people being together in one space? How can we have safe in-person voting in November? Responsible community leaders and socially responsible businesses like Ruskin are doing everything they can to keep people safe. Face masks, hand washing, social distancing. I think we all know that being outside is the safest environment, but as winter is coming on, we're going to be forced indoors. Every commercial building is required today by local codes to maintain minimum ventilation rates. Now we need to look at increasing that rate to the maximum extent possible, up to 100% outside air when conditions permit. I've given my recommendations for increased ventilation to our congregational leadership. And they called their local HVAC contractor that maintains the system for our building. The contractor came in, he looked at it, says, yeah, it's an older system. I think more outside air would stress, probably overload the system. The HVAC contractor recommended the outside air intake be left at its current setting of 10% open. What caught my ear during this conversation is what the contractor said, quote, the outside air damper set to 10%. <laughs> Are they operating under the assumption that 10% open equals 10% outside air? It doesn't work that way, but this is a common misconception. A fixed outside air damper is often closed in an older building to increase heating or cooling capacity during extremely hot or very cold days. And unfortunately, it's seldom returned to the correct position. Ideally, the amount of outside air coming into the space is measured and controlled based on the number of people in the building. However, if a system today is operating with a fixed outside air damper that's only 10% open and cannot be increased, 
then one of ASHRAE's strategy for the operation of the HVAC system is, is one method here to, to increase outside air inhalation is to run the system longer, all day long, 24 seven if possible. The indoor air dilution and overnight replacement of the air in the building is what would be accomplished so that you start off every day with new air in the building instead of each day by well, if you left the damper closed overnight to save energy, uh, then you would uh, start every day with the air that was in there yesterday. So again, they're trying to displace the air that's in there. Next slide, please. A fixed outside air damper is the most expensive way to control the air intake, especially in a building like a synagogue or a church where the space is often unoccupied for six days a week. When the building is closed and no one's inside, there's no outside air required for that space. Having a fixed outside air damper is like going on vacation for the week, leaving your home air conditioner system running and with the bedroom window open. Unfortunately, you're not there to enjoy the AC or breathe the fresh air. And as you can imagine, this is very expensive. The amount of air that comes in through a damper that's 10% open is a function of the damper's authority or damper authority. Um, is what it's called really, to have an effect on the amount of air that passes through the damper. A damper's authority changes as a function of the pressure drop across the damper. We have another webinar coming up uh, <clears throat> next week, I believe, uh, on dam and we'll include information on damper authority, but our, for our purposes today in a typical installation, the damper will have between one and 10% authority. An outside air damper can be fully open or nearly closed and have the same amount of air flowing through it. And that's because airflow through the air handler will take the path of least resistance. If the return air damper is wide open, uh, then the unobstructed airflow will recirculate through the air handler and you won't be pulling in any outside air. <clears throat> with, the, with both the return air and the outside air damper both open, only the air that is leaving the space will be pulled in through the outside air opening. So that air has got, got to be exhausted through exhaust fans or bathroom exhaust or whatever. So it's, it's generally not very much air that's coming in. And when this is the situation, the position of the outside air damper will have little effect on how much air comes into the building. This graph is showing a parallel blade damper with 100% authority would need to be 5% open to bring in 10% of its maximum flow. However, if the pressure drop across the damper is very small percentage of the system's total pressure drop, then it might need to be open as much as 60% to bring in that same amount of air. The point I wanted to make is that damper position does not equate to the amount of airflow. Regardless of the way the outside air damper is controlled manually, manually in an older system or dynamically using demand controlled ventilation, it's critical that the amount of outside air be established using other means. A test and balance contractor can come to your building and calculate the percentage of outside air using temperature balancing equations or direct airflow measurements and will be able to confirm indoor air quality is acceptable by measuring CO2 levels in the building. At the very least, minimum ventilation rates need to be maintained when the building is occupied. Today, more than ever, it's critical, bring in more outside air as much as you can to help make your space safe for you and your building's occupants. Please keep your questions coming in and we'll answer as many as we can by the end of this presentation. I'd like to introduce right now, James Livingston, and he's going to address how to keep water out of the building when you're bringing in more outside air. Take it away, James. Thank you, Glenn. A little bit about me to start with, I've been with Ruskin for 31 years, over 20 of that specifically in the Louvre product line in various roles in design and sales. And I've been regional sales for the last 10 years, mostly in the central region. Now, Glenn outlined the need for outside air in buildings and some important keys to getting more of it into the system. Since a lot of systems use louvers for this and the fact that there are several choices for louver types, we'll look at some ideas for the selection and sizing of louvers uh, to bring that air in. Uh, the louver selection can affect the health of the building. So we all know that louvers can allow air in and out of the building, but they also keep things out. Um, things like rain, pests like birds and insects, and even resist impacts from flying debris in coastal regions. 
And there's been a lot of work in the last few years with improving a louver's ways to stop rain and impacts. Louvers look much nicer than intake hoods and provide aesthetic appearances uh, by design and finishes that you just can't get with, with a hood. And depending on the style of louver used and the amount of airflow being moved through it, they can be about the same size as a hood to handle a given amount of air with a minimal increase in pressure drop and little or rain, no rain carryover. ASHRAE recently published a document that is a position document offering advice to building owners and managers on operating HVAC systems to battle airborne viruses. One of the suggestions is to continue to operate the HVAC systems rather than shutting them down. There could be a fear of transporting the virus through buildings um, if you operate the HVAC, but with proper filters and ventilation, the benefits of operating the system outweigh the disadvantages and actually creates a healthier building. Another suggestion is to increase the amount of outside air as much as you can, um, as Glenn mentioned. Open the outside air dampers as much as you can, 100% if, if you can at, at all. And another idea is to operate the HVAC systems for longer periods of time, 24-7 if possible. That should result in more outside air changes per hour within the space. But bringing more outside air through existing louvers can be hard to do. Some things you need to ask. First, is the louver sized in a way that it will handle more airflow without additional fan power? Has it been modified to reduce the capacity of air? For example, you often see blank off panels added to the back of a louver to safe it off against weather. But of course, that reduces the free area and limits how much airflow you can pull through it. Has de decorative sheet metal been added to the exterior to uh, give it a certain look, but also blocks off airflow? On large blanks of or banks of louvers with plenums behind it is the plenum designed in a way that will allow more airflow through it. All of this can create high pressure, pressure drop through the louver that is too great to allow more airflow without increasing your fan power. And for both existing and new designs, more airflow means greater potential for water, either by higher intake or longer intake periods. Now we all know that rain blowing into your building can cause a lot of trouble. Generally, standing water and plenums in ductwork often leads to water seepage inside walls and past. Wind-driven rain can travel several feet into an open mechanical room, making wet floors and equipment, and it can travel down ductwork, soaking your liner and uh, ca causing problems there. Damage to interior things such as drywall and ceiling tiles is common too. Even the best designed and fabricated sheet metal ductwork has the ability to leak if water stands in it. And all of this can lead to mold growth inside the building, which we all know is, has, is hazardous to human health. While it's always advisable for plenums and ductwork to be made in such a way that they immediately drain water out of the building, why not also use a louver that prevents that rain from blowing in in the first place? So here we have a traditional drainable blade louver uh, that have been, that style has been used in HVAC systems for many years. And with good reason, they typically provide a high amount of free area, 50 to 60% in sizes 48 by 48 and larger. And the pressure drop through them is usually low around 0 0.05 inches water gauge or less at 500 feet per minute free area velocity, which is a common design level for this type of louver. These louvers have blades that are usually widely spaced apart, typically four to six inches on center, and they're tested in what we call the AMCA still air test, which subjects them to ventilation airflow and water, but no wind. Drain gutters and the blades and frames allow these louvers to perform well in that test, even with their large blade spacing. And while the open louvers can handle a large amount of air with little rain uh, car uh, carryover in still air, they offer little uh, rejection to wind in wind-driven tests. Look at the picture on the left. That louver is a four inch, has a four inch blade spacing and you can almost reach your arm through it. Wind has an easy path through it and it will carry rain with it. The reality is that with these types of louvers, it may not matter how slow the air is moving through the free area 
when it comes to rejecting rain. The blades are just too far apart to keep the rain out, even with no ventilation airflow being pulled through it. Inspired by the recent ASH, uh, ASHRAE position document, Ruskin created a, a, a document that has advice to designers on the selection of outside air louvers. With the pandemic and the need for increased outside air, it's more important than ever to use louvers that minimize the amount of water that, car that carries over into your building. We hope you've had a chance to read it, and if not, please re uh, visit ruskin.com and take a look. So the better choice for outside air intakes are wind-driven rain-resistant louvers. These models feature closely spaced blades with special shapes that prevent wind from blowing straight through and captures and drains water away. They can be built horizontal or vertical blades. Vertical blade models are actually the best at stopping rain as they simply shed water straight down the blades and out through the front. These products are tested in a wind-driven test, which is much more severe than the still air test used on standard louvers. And the blade profiles are typically made of smooth curves and hooks, which allows airflow across very easily uh, and results in low pressure drop, and sometimes even lower per CFM than a standard louver. Here we'll take a look at the AMCA 500L wind-driven rain test. In this test, the louver is subjected to wind, rain, and ventilation airflow. In the picture on the right, you'll see that unlike the still air test we saw a few slides back, this test utilizes a wind fan and water nozzles directly in front of the louver. Water is driven into the louver core by the wind fan. The core is the face air area of the louver minus its perim perimeter frames. The standard size that we test in this is one meter by one meter core which can equate to roughly 42 inches by 42 inches OD, depending on the frame width. And there are two levels of weather that we test in, a standard level with 29 mile per hour wind and three inch per hour rainfall, and a higher level of 50 miles per hour wind and eight inches per hour rainfall. Louvers are tested at various ventilation airflow levels, beginning with no airflow and going up through five meters per second core velocity. And they receive a letter rating, class A through D. A class A rating means that the louver allowed no more than 1% of the water through it that would go through a one meter by one meter clear opening without the louver, or what we call the core plate. Another way to describe class A is 99% or better efficiency. On the other end of the rating scale, a class D louver allows more than 20% of the water through it, or another way of saying is less than 80% efficient. As a point of reference, the standard test prescribes roughly 20 gallons of water to penetrate the open core plate in the 29 mile per hour and three inch per hour rain test. In that test, the class A louver allows less than one quart of water through it in one hour. In comparison, most standard louvers are class D, which allows over four gallons through. This is on a roughly 42 by 42 OD louver. And it's reasonable to assume that the amount of water carrying over will increase as the louver size increases. Less than one quart is a lot easier to manage than over four gallons. So let's take the information we learned from the wind-driven rain test and put it to an example for sizing louvers. Here we're gonna look at a 7,000 CFM louver. And on the left, we have a common six inch deep drainable blade louver that we've sized for 500 feet per minute free area velocity, making it 72 by uh, wide by 42 high. I'm sorry, 48 high. In this size, this louver provides 14 square feet of free area or 58% and 0 0.04 inches water gauge pressure drop. This is common performance for this type of louver. But from comparison testing in the basic level wind driven rain test, we know it provides only class D rain resistance. That level of resistance allows over eight gallons of water to come in through the louver in this test. On the right is a six inch deep vertical wind driven rain louver and note that it has 25% less square footage of free area, which leads to a higher intake, velo air intake velocity. But also note that the pressure drop is almost identical, meaning it's essentially no harder to move the air through it than the standard louver, even though the wind-driven rain louver has less free area.
And the wind-driven rain louver is 99% efficient, allowing less than a half a gallon of water carry over through it. Additionally, this wind-driven rain louver provides Class A resistance up to 2,149 feet per minute free area velocity, meaning you will need very little, if any, oversizing of the louver to take it from standard air intake to maximum air. And just to give you an idea of what these uh, wind-driven rain louvers look like out in the real world, here's a couple of photographs of some uh, projects where they've been uh, put in to build to buildings. The one on the left um, is a vertical blade wind-driven rain louver. Now, you look at that all six, there's six bands of uh, intermittent gray and black colored um, devices there. And those are all vertical blade wind-driven rain louvers. So as you can see, they blend in very well with the building and um, they actually resemble metal panel or, or glass or glass panels so they look very very nice on the right is a large horizontal blade wind driven rain louver and that model uses special mullions that gives a, a pleasing uh, look in large sizes and provides a traditional louver appearance which some designers like so with the various construction styles and options that you can do with wind-driven rain louvers. They can be designed into practically any type of building. So to recap, wind-driven rain louvers are the best choice for outside air in intakes. They keep rain out of the building and minimize the problems of water uh, com coming in, such as damage to the building and mold growth. Uh, because they reject so much rain and they have somewhat low pressure drop, they are the perfect choice for airflow systems that are pulling high intakes, velocities, and long intake periods. And they can provide more CFM per square foot, meaning more airflow through the same size with very little rain. And there are many styles and options that you can have uh, to complement any style of building. So that's our piece on louvers. And now I would like to turn it over to Cody Jakes. Cody? Thank you, James. As James mentioned, I am Cody Jakes. I'm the Southeast Regional Sales Manager for Ruskin. Uh, I've been with Ruskin for about three years now. Prior to my time with Ruskin, I was actually with Ruskin Rooftop Systems and I was their ERV Sales Manager. And uh, prior to that, I actually worked at the Johnson Controls branch selling equipment up in Connecticut. Uh, James walked you through louvers and how to get outside air in through louvers. I'm gonna take you through a different product today um, energy recovery ventilators in a different way to get more outside air in your building. And we're going to jump right in with design considerations during high risk times. Glenn hit it, Glenn's phrase hit it right on the head. Dilution is the solution to pollution. Uh, the bottom line up front, exceeding minimum ventilation standards is arguably the most powerful way to reduce infection. I have a graph on the right here. That is a graph from the Wells-Riley equation. Uh, the Wells-Riley equation states that increasing ventilation rates decreases exposure via dilution. In fact, doubling your ventilation rate can potentially cut infection rates in half. Um, additionally, the ASHRAE handbook states that they recommend providing the maximum number of air changes possible while also keeping your humidity between 40% and 60% to reduce the likelihood of infection. Uh, so to summarize, more clean outside air means there is less risk. There is a reason why restaurants have moved outside during these times. Uh, AHR standards are rapidly increasing your minimum outside air requirements and energy recovery requirements, as we will see in this presentation. The problem is how are you going to pay for all of this additional outside air? The answer is energy recovery. Before we dive into the ERV itself, uh, I wanna take a big, take a step back and take a look at your system. Uh, we need to understand the ERV's role in the system before we can actually dive into the ERV. The picture on the right is a common ERV duct configuration. I'm gonna walk you through this picture here. What you see is the ERV taking in this is in, in this example, we're looking at a summer day, 96 degrees outside. The ERV takes in that 96 degree outdoor air. Then you see the ERV supply B 
feeding, in this case, we have a rooftop unit, the RTU return. Uh, so the ERV is a preconditioner. The role of the ERV is to recycle energy from the building's exhaust air and transfer this energy to the incoming uh, outdoor air. <clears throat> The ERV can reduce load on your system by up to 20%. So essentially the ERV is preconditioning the outdoor air coming into your unit. One other thing I wanna point out is that RTU return. You see that that rooftop is pulling directly from the space. Uh, that is recirculated air going back into your system. That is not purified air. Uh, this is going to be important as we talk cross-contamination later in the presentation. Next slide. So let's isolate the ERV and really get into how does an ERV work. So what you're looking at here is a typical summer day in Kansas City. Ruskin is based in Kansas City. Uh, this is real AHR data that we're using here. Uh, typical summer day design conditions. Uh, what you see is 94 hot, humid air outside. Uh, you also see 75 degree air uh, in your space, in your building. Most likely the air that you are, like the air in the room that you are sitting in listening to this webinar. Uh, in a traditional system without a heat exchanger, in this example, we are using a wheel as a heat exchanger. I'll show you a core in a second. Uh, without using a heat exchanger, you would traditionally be exhausting that 75 degree air straight out of your building. Additionally, you would be taking that 94 degree air straight into your building, into your rooftop unit, into your fan coil, uh, and then have to cool that 94 degree air down. You already spent a lot of time and a lot of money cooling down that 75 degree air in your space. Why not recover some of that energy? And that's exactly what the wheel in this example is doing. Your incoming ventilation air is temperature is reduced by 15 degrees. Next slide. When I was first learning ERVs, uh, I, I gravitated to using them in the summer. I always thought hot, humid, heat, uh, but actually the ERV, ERVs are more effective in the winter than they are in the summertime. Here you're looking again, I picked Kansas City. Kansas City design conditions, 29 degrees outside, 72 degrees in your building. Traditionally, you would be exhausting this 72 degree air outside uh, and your system would be responsible for heating up this 29 degree air. What you see here is that nice warm 72 degree air goes over the wheel. That wheel then rotates. The wheel rotates at about 60 RPM. That 29 degree air goes over the nice warm wheel. And instead of bringing 29 degree air into your system, you are bringing 62 degree air into your system. Your ventilation air temp increased by 33 degrees. Uh, that's a lot of work for a coil to do. Uh, and to get that with a heat exchanger, can really benefit your system. And also a core. Uh, core technologies are using this, it's the same concept, okay? Except instead of a rotating wheel, you essentially have two air streams overlapping on top of each other uh, without actually intersecting. The way that I think about a core is when you look at perforated cardboard, uh, you have two, you basically have two triangles stacked up on top of each other when you cut it down the middle. Uh, that perforated cardboard, if you stacked it on top uh, of each other and imagine the air going through these two these pieces of cardboard, uh, that is how the core works, okay? So our core is going to get sensible and latent recovery. Uh, we have some numbers on here to show what, what would happen with the core. What you'll notice is that the wheel is more effective, okay? Wheels are always going to be more effective than the core. Uh, a core is always going to have a higher latent recovery than the core. Um, so that is, uh, that's how the core works. Next slide. Okay, we're gonna jump into uh, some state energy codes here and some different versions of ASHRAE. Um, I want everybody to take a look around this map, see where you are, see where your state is at, uh, and see if there's any surprises. Um, I was definitely surprised when I was looking at this map. Um, and additionally, with all the outdoor air changes that we're going to see following COVID, it's going to be interesting to look back at this map in three to five years and see how much things have changed. Next slide. 
Okay, Ashray also defines some unique climate zones. Again, take a look at the map, see where you are. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pick a climate zone and I'm going to walk you through how the energy recovery codes have changed since ASHRAE 2007 uh, to where we are today. So I'm going to pick uh, zone 4A. Uh, this is where Kansas City is. I'm also the Southeast sales manager, so it's in my territory, Kansas City, where Ruskin's headquartered is in it. So I'm going to go with zone 4A. Next slide. Okay, so prior to ASHRAE 2007, there was no energy recovery code. Absolutely no code requiring energy recovery prior to 2007, okay? ASHRAE 2007 came out and stated that energy recovery is required if your system is greater than 5,000 CFM and if you are bringing in more than 70% outside air. Uh, great steps in the right direction here. However, I don't know of too many systems where we're bringing in more than 70% of outside air. Definitely not our commercial buildings that, uh, that we're designing here today. Uh, so while we got some energy recovery in the code, it did not really apply to our day-to-day -day activities. When you go to ASHRAE 2010, it significantly expanded the requirements. Uh, the table below outlines it. But what you see here is that instead of having energy recovery requirements at 70% outside air, they actually dropped it down to 30%. So you started seeing some energy recovery requirements when you were only bringing in 30% of outside air. That is five times the requirement of the previous standard. If you look at 4A, uh, where Kansas City is, and I was bringing in between 30% and 40% outside air, if my system is greater than 5,500 CFM, I am now required to have energy recovery. Next slide. ASHRAE 2016 took this even a step further and got more specific. Uh, they broke it out into two sections, basically commercial buildings and non-commercial buildings. Uh, if your system's running more than 8,000 hours per year, you're going to fall into one category. If you're less than that, you are in another. Uh, for this activity, I'm going to look at the buildings that are operating more than 8,000 hours per year, uh, which is basically your commercial buildings. They drop the requirements down to 10% of outside air. So if you are bringing in more than 10% of outside air, you have to have energy recovery uh, in zone 4A in all of your systems. It goes down to zero CFM. Uh, so you really see a drastic change. Uh, from 2007 to 2016, in zone 4A, you went from not having energy recovery requirements uh, to basically being mandated to have them. Uh, so if you have not, if you're not working with ERVs and energy recovery right now, with all of the changes to the code we are going to see uh, post COVID, uh, I expect energy recovery to be a significant part of this moving forward. Next slide. And what about cross-contamination? So this is a great question and, and, a, and a great discussion that we always have. What about cross-contamination? So on a wheel, you are typically going to see about 3% cross-contamination. On a core, it's typically going to be between 1% and 3% cross-contamination. There is a very common misconception out there uh, that, there are no, that there is no cross-contamination with a core. Uh, unless you are dealing with a non-permeable core, which most of the energy recovery companies out there uh, designed for commercial buildings are not using, uh, you are going to have cross-contamination. Uh, so a wheel and a core, both are going to have cross-contamination, but you're looking at less than 3%. Um, cross-contamination is measured by EATR, which stands for your exhaust air transfer ratio. Uh, but what I really want to point out on this slide is this graph on the right here. Uh, we talked about recirculated air with your rooftop unit at the beginning of this presentation. When we, when we talk cross-contamination, uh, it's very important to limit your cross-contamination with the ERV. However, keep in mind how much of your system is using recirculated air. Most of your recirculated air in your system is not coming from the ERV. In fact, it's only about 2% of the recirculated air in your system on average. Uh, so don't focus too much on cross-contamination. The benefits of energy recovery, 
dilution of the air and these en enhanced humidity control far outweigh the, the benefits of that far outweigh the risk of recirculating any virus. Next slide. And what can you do to mitigate the risk? How are we going to stop the spread in 2020 and beyond? Uh, some of these may be self-explanatory. However, I know we've all seen filters that have not been changed. Uh, so at step one, we say keep your air, your system balanced. Uh, run air balancing, okay? Go out and get these calculations done. Uh, we want the air pressure on the supply side to be at least half an inch higher than that on the exhaust side. Ruskin's, Ruskin's units do come. We do have an option for pressure monitor, uh, but pressure can easily be monitored by the BMS. So do your, do air balance and keep up with your system. Uh, the next is clean your heat exchanger. Whether you're using a wheel or a core, uh, they can all be clean. I'll go into some details here in a little bit, but we recommend you clean your heat exchanger every six months. Um, and then ensure your filters are changed, okay? Our, our units do have filters on them. Um, they do need to be changed. We recommend you, clean, you change the filter when you clean the wheel. Uh, but what's really important with the filters is we just talked about air balancing. If your unit isn't balanced, it, it exposes you to unnecessary. You could increase instead of having 3% cross-contamination, uh, it could go up to 5 6 7%. So, and if your filters aren't clean, your unit can't be balanced. Uh, so air, balance your unit, clean your heat exchanger, uh, and change your filters. Next slide. Maintaining the wheel. So I have pictures of a wheel here. However, the core can be cleaned with very similar steps. Uh, so our wheel is on rails. It does slide out. You can take the whole wheel out to clean it, uh, or you can just take out the wheel breaks up into little slices of pizza. Uh, you can clean each piece of the wheel individually if you would like. Uh, we, you, we recommend cleaning the wheel with just tap water. Uh, what I usually see is out in the field, you fill up a Rubbermaid container with some tap water, add household dish soap to it, um, let it sit for five minutes, and then soak and soak that wheel again with the tap water to get it clean. Um, with everybody hypersensitive about the virus right now, Air Exchange, who is our wheel manufacturer, recommends adding a 3% mixture of hydrogen peroxide to disinfect and kill the virus on the wheel as well. Um, our core is also a washable core. So we can take the core out and we can wash it. This is a really great feature and not something you see in many of the cores out there. Uh, so we recommend cleaning with tap water, household dish soap, um, and that 3% mixture of hydrogen peroxide. But I do want to talk a little bit about our core here for a minute. Um, our core does use a patented polymer membrane that allows sensible and light and energy in while completely blocking contaminants such as odors, VOCs, CO2, and viruses. Our core is made by Core Technologies, uh, formerly known as D-Point. It is the Mustang core. Uh, and one of the great features of this core is that it does not allow virus to penetrate that patented membrane. Uh, we are tested to standards, uh, and we also have mold and bacteria resistance. The cross-contamination on this core is typically less than half of a percent. Uh, and so this is really great, a really awesome feature, um, really helps you out with energy recovery and keeping the virus contained. Uh, however, keep in mind how much air is being recirculated in your system um, outside of the ERV as well. The Ruskin offers uh, three main types of ERVs here. You have your bolt-on unit. Uh, that is where we take an ERV. It works right with the economizer of your rooftop plugs right into that economizer and you see the ERV helping with the outside air load on that rooftop. You also have the standalone. This is our most popular series, uh, standalone ERVs, indoor, outdoor, um, and also our mini vent. We have a mini vent that has a wheel and a core option. Uh, the mini vent is designed to fit anywhere there's a drop down ceiling. Anywhere you see those ceiling tiles, we just need 22 inches of space and a mini vent will fit. A little bit more details on our configuration, outdoor, indoor, side by side, over, under, uh, and that mini vent is actually configurable in the field. A uh, total of 58 different models. If you have a outdoor air or energy recovery application, we can help. And who to contact? Uh, up on the screen here, we have the product manager and the director of sales, Tarkin and Tony. Uh, 
mention Ruskin Rooftop Systems is where I came from. Uh, Ruskin Rooftop is one of our sister companies that make our ERV. Mark and Tony are awesome guys. They will take care of you. Reach out to them with any ERV questions. And with that, uh, I'm going to pass it back to Tessa. All right. Thanks, Cody. So as most of you have seen, our Q&A is open, so please keep submitting your questions. You can use the box on the upper right side of your screen to submit any questions you may have. We will respond to all questions we don't get to in an email following the conclusion of this webinar. If you have any further questions after the meeting concludes, please feel free to contact Emma Barnhart. So it looks like our first question is, I typically design standard louvers to have no more than 500 FPM free area velocity. What velocity can I use for wind driven rain louvers? All right, Tess, I'll take that, that one. This is James. Uh, wind driven rain louvers, you size them a little bit differently than a standard louver. Standard louver, you might pick 500 feet per minute as your design for uh, the this, this, uh, louver, no matter what model. With wind driven rain louvers, you really need to go and see how much pressure, how much pressure drop you can um, use or have through the louver and then go to the data sheet and back into the free area velocity on that model. It's typically going to be higher, um, often going to be higher maybe than the standard louver, but the pressure drop will be the same. You never want to exceed the louver's class A rating and also uh, you can use software like Ruskin has the leads program that will help you do this too. Right, thanks James. Uh, so our next question seems to be about ERVs. So Cody, this might be up your alley. It is, uh, what should we do with our ERVs already in operation? Is it safe to leave them running? Thank you, Tessa. Uh, my answer to that question would be a resounding yes. Um, if you have ERVs in your system right now, uh, most likely the rooftops, air handlers, other equipment uh, in your system is designed with that capacity in mind with that energy recovery ventilator. Um, so if you shut it off, you are probably going to see a large increase in humidity um, and your equipment may struggle to keep up. Uh, and that is not good for uh, high risk times like right now. Additionally, um, you know, we really hammered it home with that graph. Only 2% of your recirculated air is coming from your ERV. Um, you'd have to shut off a lot more equipment if you're trying to mitigate that risk. Um, and that's not something you want to do. So yes, if you have an ERV running right now, uh, leave it on, but definitely go up and maintain it. Right, thanks, Cody. Uh, so our next question is, uh, where can I find information about ASHRAE's Building Readiness Guide? Glenn, I think you mentioned this earlier. Right, um, the, um, it's the um, ASHRAE.org, that's A-S-H-R-A-E.org slash COVID. 19 and um, what they're what they have on there is really a lot more in depth than what we got into today. Uh, you definitely <clears throat> don't want to be turning off your your systems is the wrong approach. So keep your ERVs, keep your air handlers running, and uh, that is uh, it definitely uh, what you want to do. But thanks for asking. Right, thanks. And you can see the uh, website up there on the screen right now. So we have a few more questions left. The next one is, I typically request that ductwork and plenums where louvers are installed to be made with slopes and drains to manage water that blows through the louvers. If I use wind-driven rain louvers, can I eliminate those things? Okay, Tess, I'll take that one. Um, and we would recommend that you still design your plenums and ductwork with provisions to manage water that might blow through. The wind-driven rain louvers will reduce the amount that goes through it, but there may still be some water getting through them, particularly in higher velocity winds and heavier rains and what we test in. The difference is the amount of water that goes through the louver into the building with a wind-driven rain louver is gonna be much, much less than a standard louver and much easier for the system to deal with. Right, thank you, James. So it looks like we have time for two more questions. So the next one is, it was stated that the outside air damper could be closed when the building is unoccupied, as well as when you operate HVAC systems for longer periods of time, 24 seven, if possible. It should result in more outside air changes per hour in the space. 
Should the system be ventilated 24 seven with the outside air or should there be no outside air when unoccupied? Uh, this is Glenn and great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, to avoid any confusion there, um, basically as part of James presentation and uh, what they're suggesting uh, from the ASHRAE website is that ventilation systems be run for longer periods of time, 24 seven if possible to change out <clears throat> all the air in the space so that you start off each day with a, a fresh air in the building. Um, what I was addressing is during uh, a normal operation for, for most systems in order to maintain the uh, minimum ventilation rates required for the space, you only need to ventilate that space when it's occupied. And what we're talking about here is during this pandemic, maybe it makes sense to run that system 24 seven, especially if you're not able to increase the uh, outside air intake through the day, which would be ideal. Really, that's what you want to be doing. But I hope I've answered that question. Right, I think I did. I think it did. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, so our last question is, is there a specific environment where ERVs work best? Are there any temperature limits we need to be concerned about? Uh, yeah, Tessa. So ERVs are going to work better in humid environments. OK, uh, the more humidity you have. So basically east of the Rockies, uh, that's where you're going to see your payback on ERVs be really strong. Um, and then as regards to temperature, uh, no, there's no real temperature limits or temperature restrictions on an ERV. Um, what I will say is the more extreme temperatures you have, uh, whether it's either really hot or really cold, um, your, your effectiveness uh, is going to be better and your payback is going to be quicker. With that said, if you're in a very cold environment, you definitely want to look at a few of our frost control measures um, to ensure that your ERV is going to operate in those cold weather conditions. Uh, right. All right. Thanks, Cody. So unfortunately, that is all the time we have today for questions, and we thank you for attending today's webinar. We will be sending out an email after the meeting concludes with responses to more of your questions, certificates of attendance, and a link to next week's webinar registration. That being said, please join us next week on August 26th at 1 p.m. Central Time for our discussion on damper selection with Mike Coyazzo. Thank you again for attending, and we hope you all have a wonderful day.